Let's see. Okay, great. Uh, good evening, everybody. This is Patrick from the Poison Pen Bookstore in Scottsdale, Arizona. And thanks for tuning in to another of our virtual events. And we are delighted to have Kath Catherine Shellman with us today. She's going to be talking about her latest in the Lily Adler series, Murder at Midnight. And just today, Catherine, you'll be happy to hear we received our signed copies. So, oh, good. Yeah. I was hoping they'd make it. They did. So we have some signed ones available here. And I'll go ahead and put a link in the comments field if should you wish to purchase one. Um, and if you have questions for Catherine, go ahead and put them in and Barbara will uh, bring me back on screen towards the end of the hour and I'll be happy to ask any questions you might have. So Barbara, over to you. Thank you, Patrick, very much. You'll be pleased to know, those of you watching, this is a Christmas story, an Agatha Christie Regency Christmas story in point of fact. So, um, an excellent book to buy early. Publishers increasingly are putting out Christmas books like in September, um, you know, and I, I myself think they're really rushing it, but then we get Valentine books in December. So, I, you know, what can I say? Anyway, it is a Christmas story and it's the fourth in the Lily Adler series. But I thought Catherine and I might talk a little bit about about Regency fiction. Catherine, you know, why why does it draw you? Why did you decide to write about the Regency? I think I initially started writing about the Regency because it was an era that I thought I knew a lot about from a historical perspective. So I assumed I would not have to do a ton of historical research going into it. I discovered basically as soon as I started writing that that was very wrong. I needed to do a lot more research to really make the world feel very believable and lived in. But luckily, I I really enjoy that sort of thing. So it ended up being a fun problem to have. Um, but I, and it also gives you a lot of ideas for things to, to write about new plot ideas, new character ideas. So it all, it all worked out, but it was definitely an era I thought I knew more about than I did going in. So when you say you thought you knew a lot about it, are you a Jane Austen reader? Is that where it began? That was, yeah, and like so many people, that was where I, I got my interest in the era. Um, and you know, you read a few Jane Austen and she, there's so much that's so fascinating about the time period that she includes. You see so much of the the social lives of people. You get a lot of sense of sort of the economic background, which she doesn't go into in great detail, but it's there and it underpins all of the stories. It's how, you know, economics and, and money plays in these people's lives. And I thought I had a really good sense from reading fiction that was published during the time or fiction about the time period of what you know, what life was like then. And I had a very good sense of some aspects of life in that era, but there's, of course, there's always more to discover. Well, like, like everything else in publishing, they have, how can I put this? Interest in different periods and different kinds of books goes up and down. It's sort of a Certainly generational does. thing. And, um, you know, Jane Austen was among the very, not the first, but certainly a pioneering author uh, of the novel, which uh, I think, I'm trying to remember, it was Richardson, I think, wrote the first actual novel in English in 1749 or something called Pamela, which I've actually read. Um, and with the, it was an epistolary novel because since nobody actually had written novels, they had to come up with some kind of a structure. And mm -hmm. if you write a novel, which is letters moving back and forth, then you get uh, different voices, you get different characters and you get a plot that moves forward since the letters go back and forth. There, there have been people like Meg Cabot who've adapted that to, let's say, emails, you know. It, it yes. Comes up. So when I say epistolary, it's an old fashioned word for letter, but in point of fact, people are still writing novels like that. And Jane Austen wrote in her, what's called her juvenilia, she wrote a book called Lady Susan, which was mm -hmm. in fact a set of letters going back and forth. And then if those of us who read and loved Jane Austen probably moved on to Georgette Hare, who I think in many ways is more fun, even if, you know, slightly less authentic, but really worked hard on it. And today we have a whole kind of renaissance of it. So are there any current authors that you read in the Regency or, or do you try to avoid that, Catherine, because that's what you're writing? Um, I think I don't read, at least when I'm drafting, I don't read as many Regency mysteries because you're right, it is its whole, a whole genre, really. There's mm -hmm. a lot of uh, Regency books and Victorian is also a really a other popular era in the uh, in the mystery world. And then, you know, there's the romances that where I think we're 
as Regency romances was a genre that was really uh, pioneered by George at higher and you know has has continued on through this day um Martha Waters is a, a writer that I know whose books I really enjoy she writes Regency romances um but you know there's also a number of, of Regency writers the Sebastian Sincere books are really fun Regency mysteries um Darcy Wilde I believe has a lot of that that era and so there's just you know there's a whole lot variety out there and I think it's really fun that it's having a bit of a moment right now I think people who've always loved the Regency have always had a lot of books to read in that era, but I think it's made its way into the mainstream a little more in the last few years, which is a lot of fun. Right. Well, as I said, it's come up again. Historical fiction mm -hmm. in general is having a renaissance, as we British would like to say, or a renaissance, as we say. Um, and Regency is part of it. C.S. Harris um, it writes the Sebastian Sans series, mm -hmm. which has a, they have a male protagonist, though there she has a couple of very strong female character Stephanie Barron who will be with us at the end of October writes um uh, the being Jane Austen mystery I love them so much which are absolutely wonderful and tragically this is the last one because Stephanie has followed Jane chronologically through mm -hmm. her life and uh 1817 is the year that she died so this final mystery is set in Winchester, where Jane died in 1817. Um, the research she must do for that series just absolutely boggles my mind to get all of the the beats that we know from Jane Austen's actual life, from her letters and her yeah. work and the people's work about her, but put it all into the context of these mysteries that she's creating. I just think that's fascinating. It's amazingly well done. It really is. 15 books and, you know, just <laughs> marvelous. Um, she writes them you know, um, she looks, works very hard to uh, write the mysteries and the kind of gaps in Jane Austen's life. If, you know, read through the letters in times when Jane's life is not well documented is when these mysteries occur. And she's, she's a, you know, kind of hews the line in, in the right. sense. I mean, there's a big difference between Jane Austen, Georgia Hare, Stephanie Barron, C.S. Harris, and Regency romances, which actually are many of them just sex and, you know, different skirts. <laughs> um, so I think a, a really crucial part of, of the Regency, and one of the reasons it's always fascinated me, is there are very strict social rules. There, you know, it's a very much a class system. Uh, the upper class, they were, didn't have jobs. You know, they were so... Money was a function of either inheriting it or marrying it. Mm -hmm. But, you know, few of them actually earned it. So right. that was a constant thing and a constant problem. And for young women, if they were going to marry well, in the sense of marrying any sort of money or property, they had to abide by these social rules. But then the rules didn't really apply to married women much. So there was a lot of sex and scandal and stuff going on. But if your focus is writing about, um, you know, women who are not yet in that, mm -hmm. then they really do have to, and it was terribly easy to lose your reputation. You know, yep. the rules were so strict that just a slight um accident or stray could really ruin a young girl's reputation. And if that were true, then the odds were that she would have a very difficult life because she wouldn't marry well um, unless her family had money. You know, she'd wind up being a governess or some kind of profession. Or um, dependent on relatives who did not like providing for her for the rest of her life. Well, that's right. I mean, you can even see it in Downton Abbey, you know, which mm -hmm. is considerably later what, what happens to the peripheral members of the family. But I guess what I what I've always found so interesting about the Regency is this this sort of very strict social code and class system. And then offsetting it is all the, you know, all the other stuff. And, and it was tacit that people knew that, you know, married people slept around and children were all, you know, very often not the children of their ostensible parents. And you know that's all. Legally, thing. if a child was born while that's you right. were married, the the husband was responsible for it, even if everyone right. knew it was not his child. Like that was just how that worked. 
it was how that works. So they, you know, the object divorce was extremely difficult and very unlikely. Um, and so, you know, there was a lot of trying to like keep the family together, even if it was a wildly dysfunctional, wildly dysfunctional family, which many of them were. So there have been a, you know, Alison Goodman, who I thought wrote a very interesting, and I'm trying to remember, it's called the Something Society of Benevolent Ladies. Um, I've wonder, heard of it. I've not yet read that one, it's but a I've heard of it. Book. But she has two older unmarried sisters uh, who have money of their own. Um, and the way they're navigating that world is different mm -hmm. and kind of interesting. And one of them, there's the possibility of a very mature romance. So that's a lot of fun. And then we have Claudia Gray. I don't know if you've had a chance to look at the murder of Mr. Wickham and the late Mrs. Willoughby. I have the late Mrs. Willoughby on my bookshelf downstairs waiting for me to finish the draft I'm working on so I can pick it up. Right. So I'm just mentioning these other authors mm -hmm. to show you how many. Um, There's I'm, a lot. Yeah, Yeah, there really are. And there are a couple of very, you know, um, 18th century moving back a bit in time. Victorian has been popular much, much longer, I think, and more heavily mm -hmm. than Regency. I mean, it, it maintained um, a lot of drag. Um, over the last years, even when the Regency was not quite so big. I think the the Regency for a long time was sort of the the territory of romance writers, and mm -hmm. it's definitely moved more into, into mystery writers recently, which is, it's you know, and I think both genres are really enjoyable. But like you said, there's so much to play with there in terms of the class dynamics and the social dynamics and who you're writing about. And it just, there's there's a lot of very interesting sort of the nitty gritty of society, their society to dive into and to really pull into creating interesting mysteries and interesting conundrums for characters right. to deal with. And then, you know, you take something like Bridgerton, which is actually pushing race into a whole different, mm -hmm. um, you know, Bridgerton to me is all about the costumes. I'm sorry, but I think the costumes in Bridgerton are absolutely gorgeous. And the rest of it is wildly improbable, but still. <laughs> I don't think anyone's watching it for believability. <laughs> no, no. Lots of sex, lots of great clothes. <laughs> you know, there we go. Pretty people having trouble. Yeah, well, you know, but it was a time of wonder, uh, really interesting architecture, very, you know, um, uh, it was very a time of very a great emphasis on fashion. Um, and um, a real, the fashion was a real reaction to the, the much more rigid fashion of the 18th century. You know, people went around in muslin and sort of some women in largely transparent clothing and, um, you know, they were more which like they would then get a little bit damp just to make it a little clingy too, which I yes. think is just such a fun random fact about the era. Oh, I've always they damped their petticoats, as George mm -hmm. Carroll would say, and some of them then, and you know, because of the rigors of climate, actually got pneumonia, you know, and, and died. It was, a, it, was a, it was a dangerous game, but you know, they were willing to play it. Yeah, no, absolutely. But I mean, it's it's a lot of fun to look at the fashion, look at the you know the craze for like Egyptian furniture. All kinds of, you know, it's a time of transition from the 18th century and, and its structures to the Victorian and its structures. Uh, but it's a much more open, it's almost like the 1920s in that sense, you know, <laughs> that it, there's much more freedom going on. So you've chosen with Lily Adler. Tell us about Lily because you've chosen, first words, she's a widow. And that was the very best thing to be at this point, um, especially. There's if a reason were, she's a widow. Yeah, yeah especially <laughs> if you were left any kind of money, if you were left mm -hmm. any kind of jointure, as they called it. Uh, a widow was probably of all the female, you know, categories, the freest. Yes. And that I think when you're writing a character who has to have a lot of freedom of movement, in terms of where she's going and who she's interacting with so that she can find out what she needs to know. A widow gives you a lot of opportunities that a, a woman in basically any other position would not have. Um, you know, if she was, if you're writing a young unmarried character, they're very closely watched by their parents, by their you know grandparents, governess, chaperone, whoever's in charge of them at the time, like someone's got eyes on them. And if they don't, then it's a real problem. Uh, 
And if you're writing someone who's married, then there's a lot of expectations in terms of what you're doing with yourself socially. And are you a parent? And are you trying to be a parent? And what does your husband expect of you? And you know, are where do you live? Do you live in the city? Do you live in the country? Do you have any control over where you live? Or is your husband deciding those things? Um, you don't have access necessarily to your own money or to your own property. And if you have a widow, suddenly some you can have your own property. You do have your own money. You do have control of your time and your schedule and who you interact with. And that's not to say that someone who's a widow doesn't have considerations of you know, social expectations or reputation or, you know, the, uh, the what, what they are and are not permitted to do in terms of the rules of the society they're in. But there's a lot more freedom of movement. So in terms of writing a sleuth who has to get into some uh, tricky situations that having, having Lily be a widow really gives you a lot, a lot to play with. And I've definitely made use of that. Um, but I will say I tried to, yeah, I think it's, it's kind of expected in, a lot of um, sort of period, modern modern written period uh, set, uh, fiction of any kind, whether it's, you know, a romance or mystery, that you're going to have someone who just doesn't care what people think about them, their reputation, or, you know, what people expect of them. And they're willing to just like throw it all to the wind and do whatever they want to. And I wanted to write a character who wasn't like that. So really, Lily is still very aware of you know, what people expect of her and, you know, what she can get away with and what she can't. So she's not necessarily openly defying uh, social expectations, but she's she's quietly defying them and trying not to get found out. Well, I mean, she does have a level of independence. However, mm -hmm. um, she does have, um, how, how is she widowed? I mean, this is book four, so we need to lay mm -hmm. a little foundation here. Um, is Lily married when it starts or is she a widow when we meet her? What happens? So in book one, um, Lily is recently widowed to about two years before. So she's coming out of mourning, going back to London, sort of trying to figure out what to do with her life. And she was widowed very young mm -hmm. um, and unexpectedly. Her husband uh, got sick and, and died very young. And... Uh, so in book one, she's really just trying to figure out what is she going to do with herself? You know, she had a very specific plan for what she thought her life was going to be. She was going to get married. She was going to have a family. Her husband wanted to go into politics. And then all of a sudden, all of that is taken away from her. And in the Regency, you know, someone who's a widow had a lot of freedom, but they didn't have a very set place in society, especially if they weren't from like a big prominent family. There was a large expectation that, okay, you're widowed. You're going to get married again that's what you're going to do because that's what women do. So in the first book, we meet Lily and she doesn't, she doesn't want to get married again. She's still very, uh, in very much in her, her first marriage. She's very much in love with her husband, even though he's, he passed away and she's trying to decide, well, what does that mean for my life now? Um, and she <laughs> almost literally stumbles across something to do when she discovers a dead body. So it's a, an unconventional route out of mourning, but she she has a mystery that needs to get solved. Um, and some of her friends are caught up in it. So to protect them, she sort of dives into it and tries to figure out what's going on and discovers that she has a real uh, knack for unraveling puzzling situations and a real uh, interest in you know seeing seeing justice done for people who wouldn't necessarily be getting as much legal consideration in the time period as someone of her class or of someone with more money or more stature. Um, so in book four, we find her a few years into uh, not necessarily publicly investigating crimes, but having, having stumbled across more than her fair share of dead bodies and, and helped some friends and acquaintances out of some tricky predicaments. So she's uh, visiting her, her, in-laws, her late husband's family for the Christmas season. And in classic whodunit fashion, there is a snowstorm that traps her and several under other guests at a sort of isolated country manor where you know there's a storm happening, no one can come, no one can go. They're just kind of stuck there for a little while. And everyone goes to bed expecting just a normal night. And when they wake up in the morning, there is a dead body on the grounds. And since no one could come or go in the night, they know the killer is someone in the house. So there's definitely a, that, that really strong, uh, like you said, I think you mentioned Agatha Christie yeah. at the beginning. That was definitely the vibe that I was going for that sort of locked room, closed circle of suspects, you know, anyone could have done it and everyone is keeping secrets. So she yeah. has to find out who it was. 
Well, it's not, it, it, I, this keeps coming up. It's not a locked room mystery because it's no. not an impossible crime. It's not in a room. No, no but it, <laughs> it is a country house murder in the mm -hmm. sense yeah. that. You have the, a, the closed circle. Exactly. There's a limited number of suspects and either in a classic closed circle, either the sleuth is on the scene, like, you know, already a guest or only one, you know, investigator can make it through the snow to, you know, to see how it goes. So um, and oftentimes there is um, if you're writing an amateur sleuth, <clears throat> excuse me, at some point, at some point, you have to have somebody who actually has the power of arrest you know, show up, um, at least at the end of it. So that's always an interesting question is, you know, how does somebody like Lily, even if she investigates the crime and um, kind of comes up with a solution, you still have to provide her with somebody who's going to be able to, you know, arrest the villain. Well, and in, you know, in the Regency era, that's always going to be a man. There's going to be various constables, there's going to be magistrates. So in this situation, Luckily, uh, Lily's brother-in-law, uh, her late husband's older brother, is a local magistrate, and he gets snowed in with her. So he's technically the one investigating the crime, but because he knows Lily has encountered a dead body or two in her time, she he uh, is open to letting her poke around as well. So the no, two of them I mean, end up it works together. It, it works perfectly. It's a real, you know, classic setup. And of course, you know, Christmas is a it's a poignant background for a murder mystery, you know, because it's not what we expect to happen. And, you know, everybody's looking at, you know, joy and presence and the whole bit. And so murder is a real disruptor of the <laughs> of the holiday feeling and the holiday. It's, it's it's its own genre, right? The Christmas mystery, because everyone loves that contrast between here's this really cozy time of year that's supposed to be joyful, but isn't always for everyone and is supposed to feel loving and welcoming. And then, oh, there's a dead body also. So I think well, it's also true really that, enjoys you know, that. Yeah, Christmas, the holidays are, you know, frequently a time that exacerbates family stress and mm -hmm. family tensions. And, you know, everybody comes together ostensibly to celebrate, but it often and is. And then they're stuck time. together. Yeah. And <laughs> often it's a time when um, every once in a while, because it's right above the bridge end, um, I read Dear Abby because, you know, it's there while I'm having coffee. And I just can hardly believe the you know, the the things that people write in about, about, you know, the stressors in their their lives or, you know, the umbrage or outrage they're suffering over something and all. And I think it's incredible how dysfunctional, you know, it all is, but it's always made worse by either a wedding or the mm -hmm. holidays. Those are the two things that seem to write, you know, old grudges and old old hurts and old resentments and all, all seem to just like fountain up when it comes to the, to a holiday gathering of one sort or another. Anytime everyone is supposed to be on their best behavior, no one is on their best behavior. <laughs> right. So you've basically got, got a classic. And, you know, for people who, <clears throat> excuse me, I'm sorry, I'm still getting over some kind of a cough thing. For people who think, you know, they don't want to read historical fiction, um, if you're an Agatha Christie fan, although Agatha Christie is definitely historical fiction now, even if it wasn't. Now it is. Right. <laughs> That's right. Um, you know, this is a this is a really nice book to read because all of the dynamics, all the structures and so forth are there. Um, it's just. Well, thank uh, you. Well, I, no, I, I really enjoy it. I think I think a ball was such an important social occasion you know, when people, because people had to travel fair distances to assemble. They didn't have great roads. They sometimes had to walk. I just watched on the way home from Quebec, um, a movie about becoming Jane Austen or something with, um, I'm trying to think, <clears throat> excuse me, who Anne Hathaway is playing Jane. But um, there's sort of a, a, a climactic scene is going to be a ball in one of these great Regency houses. And they show people arriving and many of them are walking a considerable right. distance wearing their, you know, their boots and carrying their, their slippers and the whole bit. Some of them arriving by coach and all, but, but it, it's, it really is an assembly that mm -hmm. covers quite a lot of distance for neighbors right. to get together. And 
most of the time balls went on all night and ended with a breakfast. And often once you've made all the effort of getting there, you weren't leaving anytime soon. Yeah, right. And oftentimes um, there were considerable house guest lists as well. Mm -hmm. You know, of course, we're looking at houses that might have 24 bedrooms. And right. (laughs) right. I mean, it was basically like, you know, those great houses really functioned like hotels um, Mm -hmm. with servants and multiple bedrooms and no bathrooms to share. You know, that's the part. That's the part that we often overlook was that falling water you know, up and down the stairs. Yes. All of that. Right. Um, the sanitary arrangements were never going to be absolutely wonderful. But anyway, so it's, you know, a Christmas ball in particular, I think, um, is a spectacular example of how all that mm-hmm. works. So did you have fun designing your ball? I did. I, I love a good ballroom scene. The first Lily Adler book um, has a ball right at the beginning, and this one does too, because I think there's such a fun way to bring such a, a disparate cast of characters together. And because people, you know, they're dancing, they're walking around, they're overhearing conversations, it lets you plant a lot of different seeds um, that, you know, readers are like, oh, is that going to be important? Is that going to be important? And, you know, there's the you don't necessarily know what's going on with everyone, but you get little snippets of, of a lot of different plot threads. And I think, a, especially in a historical setting, especially in the Regency, a ball is such a fun setup so that you get a little taste of so many characters in quick succession. And then you have whatever your big exci- inciting incident is going to be. Well, a ball often function, as the Regency people would say, is a marriage mart. In other mm-hmm. words, you know, this was a place for young young women to be brought out um, or put in the public eye, and you know, with potential suitors. And you know, much of the much of the impulse towards marriage was financial, or you know, joining estates, whatever it might happen to be. I mean, property was always, as you earlier said, economics at the bottom of it all. It was, well, for women, that was their job. They couldn't get. They couldn't go out and have a career, you know, finding, be, being marriageable and then getting married and then being married. That was, that was their career because that was how they could provide for themselves and often for their extended families if they needed to as well. Right. And of course, part of the job was to produce children who mm-hmm. could inherit. Um, all, one of my all time favorite characters in women, actual women in British history is Bess of Shrewsbury, who was an orphan. Um, at, at initially, and through four marriages, became richer than Queen Elizabeth the first. Um, the Devonshires, Chad, you know, Chatsworth, all of that is still today. Those people are living on the property that Bess of Hardwick assembled back in the 16th century. I mean, she was just astonishing. But the whole thing was that she kept marrying up. You know, that was her she, job, and she did a really good she job. She really did. She finally <laughs> ended up um, marrying the um, Earl of Shrewsbury, and um, he was the the guardian of Mary, Queen of Scots. So, you know, Bess was much involved in that. But I mean, it it was really. I think her life is is improbable, and also fascinating. You know that she it feels she like fiction. That. Yeah. Um, and then she left a legacy behind, as I say, that's still supporting people today, mm-hmm. even though the aristocracy today is not living just on rents from its land. They've all had to they've had to learn how to make money one way right. or another. Right. So anyway, is Lily developing um, now that she's been a widow for some time? Is she, um, as we would say today, dating? Uh in she is a little bit. I think in book three, she gets involved with a, a new suitor who she she previously met. And uh, he is also a character in this one. So there's I wouldn't I would not quite call it a, a love triangle in this one. But there's definitely a character that a number of readers have contacted me to say, but wait, what about him? Uh-huh. So there's a little bit of romance there. But, um, you know, I think. For me, I always start with characters when I'm writing. Um, the, you know, once I have my characters, that tends to inform what my plots end up being. Although for this one, I knew I wanted to write a Christmas mystery going in, so then I had to figure out how that how that was going to work for these characters. Uh, but 
I always, I always want to have a little bit of what's going on with the characters themselves and their personal lives and their personal sort of growth. Um, and that's been a big part of Lily's story because she did start out the series feeling very alone and feeling very lost and unsure of what she was going to do with herself. And um, it's been, it's been a real treat to sort of develop that character and that confidence and that sense of who she is on her own, not, you know, as someone's daughter or as someone's wife, but but who she is as a person and her own self, and then have her be able to bring that back into the world in the, okay, am I ready to see what else is out there in a in either a, a sense of friendship or family familiar relationships or romantic relationships? And I think that's um, that's definitely very present in this one. Well, she's not actually under pressure to marry again. I mean, you know, she's certainly right. the Maury's of the time. She could actually, you know, take a lover if she wanted to. But, you know, if she... <laughs> Another fun thing about being a widow. <laughs> yeah, exactly. You know, so, I mean, she has, she has many choices. Now, in order to, in order to write, I think, um, a really powerful mystery, we have to care about the victim. So... Without, will it spoil anything if you want to talk a little bit about who the body that, you know, we find on the grounds might be? So one of the main characters in these books is um, a naval captain named Jack Hartley. And he was the childhood, uh, very close friend of Lily's uh, late husband. So he's been a character uh, through since book one. Um, he and Lily have become very good friends. And, uh, you know, he he sort of, he, he started out feeling very much as her protector, you know, in place of her husband, but they have developed much more of a relationship of equals as, mm -hmm. as the series went on. And in this one, you, you don't really get to meet the murder victim before he, he gets uh, bumped off, but uh, he, you do know uh, that he was perhaps caught in a bit of a compromising position, or at least there are rumors that imply that with Jack's younger sister, uh -huh. who is also uh, a guest at the party who gets snowed in. So when he, uh, when, when he is found dead in the morning, suspicion is immediately on her because people are, no one knows exactly what happened between the two of them, but she's the person most scandalously connected to him in, in the neighbor's eyes and in sort of the public gossip that's been going around. So uh, Lily and, and Jack also have their work cut out for him trying to figure out what happened so that his sister is not uh, endangered, uh, in addition to everyone else in the house being in danger because there's clearly a killer there. Um, so that, I think, is the sort of the real emotional tie-in for readers. Right. Well, and it adds urgency to the investigation. Mm -hmm. Um, justice was pretty swift in those days. You know, we, we don't realize today with our gazillion appeals and the fact that people, you know, there's no death penalty anymore and so forth, but that certainly wasn't true in, in this time. So being and court public opinion could be very, very right. brutal, not just in like a social sense, but in terms of persuading a jury or a magistrate right. or, you know, there wasn't the same, you know, careful gathering of evidence and looking for fingerprints and DNA that we have now. It's what seems most likely and what is a jury going to be persuaded to believe and Thank social uh, social cues and social interactions and what sort of the opinion of the neighborhood was it would have a really strong impact on that. So Jack's, Jack's sister is, is in ver a very dangerous predicament at the start of this. Well, and they, yeah, there's kind of a rush to restore order. You know, everybody's horrified at the idea of of danger. And so, you know, there's a rush. There can easily be a rush to judgment. And there's no way to uh, to figure out if you can exonerate someone after the fact, because, you know, no one's collecting DNA evidence along the way. So it's a, a very, like you said, a very swift and uh, brutal process if you're caught up in it. Absolutely. The judge puts on his black hat and, you know, off you go yeah. to by the neck until you're dead. And I don't know whether I, you know, whether somebody like Jack's sister would actually would actually be hanged um, or what they would do with her. I mean, one of the one of the things that operates behind the scenes at this time um, was women could be put into madhouses um, mm -hmm. almost at a whim. Um, and you know, it 
there's certainly one one of the authors, I won't give away which one, that I mentioned earlier is writing today, a solution to, to the crime is in fact a woman and she's sent off to, you know, to some version of Bedlam, uh, you know, Bethlehem Hospital for the Insane rather than, um, you know, rather than executed. So I, I don't know that women, especially upper class women, were necessarily hanged. But once you got into an institution like that or whatever, it would be very difficult. You were not coming back out. out. No, <laughs> you really weren't. Um, so, you know, they, yeah, there's a lot of compulsion here to, you know, to get at it and solve the mystery. As you're writing a series like this, Andrea, because I know you write, um, sorry, Catherine, um, I You've written, in, you write in a different era, a, a different mm -hmm. series. You know, it's almost impossible not to acquire a supporting cast, isn't it? I mean, right. you just have Lily all by herself starting over again every book with a completely new field of people around her. No, I, I really enjoy playing with the supporting cast. There's definitely a lot of characters to choose from at this point, and not all of them appear in every book, especially because Lily does move around the country a little bit. There's two books in London. There's one book in Hampshire. This one's in Hertfordshire. So not, to me, if it would feel very implausible if every character was traveling to the same locations together. Um, but there's definitely a, a cast of them to pull on. And I think that's that's also fun when you're a reader who's read a whole series to be checking back in with the characters you met earlier. Um, but it also, it, you know, by book four in the series, it, it's very helpful, I think, for you know, the amateur you sleuth field shop, to have people have who have. Um, and all around this yeah. time, my old pal Steve Parkins, we're going to be discussing the I'm not sure to have people who've, who've worked with her before. Um, and so they're not like questioning her expertise in the same way or her insights in the same way that someone in the first in the first book would have been doing because they, she didn't have any any background to pull on. Um, so I think having the the recurring cast of characters is a lot of fun to play with. Oh, I think that readers oftentimes get well, not oftentimes, but at least sometimes get more attached to the subordinate characters than they do. To the main character, and often um, at events at the store, we we hear readers suggesting that the author, you know, write a book about. Um, you need a spinoff. <laughs> exactly. Well, if not a spinoff, maybe just give you know a big part to that to that character. Um, but you're absolutely right. You can't as they begin to accumulate. You can't haul the entire group right. with you. It's not like you know your Queen Elizabeth on the first. You, know, you don't have your entourage. <laughs> right. You can't you can't move the whole court with you. But um, I would think that that would be a lot of fun. And, you know, also the possibility exists if you're looking to raise the temperature that, you know, why you can't really kill off your main character. The other other characters are not necessarily safe. So, right. you then know, you have that option. Being danger is very motivating. Them. Yeah, yeah. So, um, so tell us a little bit about your other series. It's funny that you mentioned the 1920s earlier because my other series is uh, set in the Jazz Age in New York City, um, and that one it's a it's a, got a very different feel from the Lily Adler series. Lily Adler's um, it's much more of a traditional whodunit. It's working with the upper class. It's in England, so it's got a lot more of that very you know traditional London crime genre feel to it. Um, the other mystery series that I write, The Nightingale Mysteries, is set in 1920s New York City. Um, it's uh, following a working class character. Her name is Vivian. She is a seamstress and an Irish immigrant. Um, and she essentially has a very, it's, it's an unglamorous, unappealing, very life full of drudgery. But she escapes that in the nights by going to a speakeasy called The Nightingale which as far as she concern, she's concerned is just a, a big party. It's just an escape from everything else going on in her life. Uh, but she discovers that the under party, has, the, uh, the party has a bit of a dark underside when she finds a dead body behind the club. And she uh, you know, doesn't necessarily want to get involved, but there are people who think she knows more about what happened than she does. So she gets kind of pulled into the, the darker world that supported, you know, that speakeasy nightlife, which involves, you know, 
a lot of a lot of a lot of crime and a lot of uh, very shady people. Um, so it's uh, you know it's it's very it's it's a different feel. Uh, it's a little grittier. It's a little darker, but it has a lot of still that same sort of amateur sleuth. You know, I'm just trying to figure out what's going on and protect the people I care about. Uh, so I think that's that's a, a common a common thread that would unite both series is if you if you really like a very deep supporting bench of characters that have really strong you know relationships and that sense of found family and you know, wanting to take care of the people in your life then that's you know you'll get that in both series so how do you manage your time if you were writing two series and are you on a relatively annual cycle with both of them right now i'm doing two books a year one from each series um, so in terms of how i manage my time probably not as well as i should I think I'm always scrambling a little bit to get things done and always finding out that you know the deadlines for the two series are closer together than I expect them to be. Um, but I tend to go back and forth between them. You know, if right now, um, I just turned in copy edits for the next Nightingale book that's coming out next year. And so I'm switching gears from that to working on uh, the draft of The Fifth Lily Adler, which will also come out next year. So just sort of jumping back and forth between the two of them. And luckily, you know, being in two very different time periods with two very different casts of characters, it helps me uh, helps me keep things straight when I'm jumping back and forth. Well, I admire your energy. That's, um, that's oh, thank you. <laughs> a lot to do, especially if you're writing two historical series where you do have to a fair amount of research to do because the 1920s, after all, is 100 years ago. You know, when I started the store in 1989, the 1920s were barely considered historical fiction. And now I realized to my horror, not long ago, when my friend Lori King wrote a book set in 1970, whatever it was, that that the line now, the 50-year line, is not the 1920s, but in fact, the 1970s, you know, mm -hmm. we're advancing. Um, and so <laughs> it was the 1920s was a very hard sell back then, mm -hmm. because it didn't feel historical enough or contemporary enough. But now... You know, with that distance, when it's a century old, um, it's much more, I think, there are many more people working in, in the 20s and, you know, sure. much more interest in it. So um, I I've really enjoyed seeing how all this works. 34 years is a long time to be watching, you know, how it all progresses. Yeah. That's a really unique perspective to have on watching all these trends in fiction and what's considered what what fits into what genre sort of come come through the store? It is. It's been fascinating, and you know, we have, or at least I have, but some of my staff have been with me almost as long. Um, you know, we've read in real time: John Sanford, Michael Connolly, Lisa C. Um, you know, Janet Ivanovich. I just booked her for her thirtieth book. Um, and I remember when one for the money came out and, you know, whatever. So it is interesting to see the trends. And I've come to the conclusion that genre fiction, it's about a, a generational cycle. Things mm -hmm. go up and down on roughly a 20-year kind of a, a cycle because back in 1989, the historical mystery was huge. And then the women's sleuth movement took over and then you know, the Da Vinci clones took over and then we got Gone Girl and all. And now historical fiction, it's been its 20 year mm -hmm. old and now it's coming back again, which is fine because I love historical fiction. So I'm really delighted with it. Horror is making a comeback. I mean, it, it was not terribly well or frequently published. And all of a sudden, particularly this fall, because, you know, it's that season, there's a huge amount of horror being written, which five years ago, you couldn't even find. So a lot of it, horror, a lot of sort of gothic horror. Like yes, the that gothic, kind of that. exactly. Mm -hmm. You know, and people don't really fully understand what gothic means, just like, you know, locked room. It gets slapped on a lot of stuff yeah, as a label. Exactly. <laughs> you know, there are buzzwords that come up like mm -hmm. gothic or, you know, whatever. But it, it's been fun. And um, I think for readers, uh, what you have to hope is that you're getting a new generation of readers and that's why part of this is happening is that they haven't read. And one of the things we've noticed about the pandemic, uh, Patrick, come and join us because you can speak to this as much as I, is the tremendous sales of classics that, you know, been republished and 
I can hardly, I would never have imagined the turnover in classics that we experience every day. Would you, Patrick? It's great. No, it's it's really heartening to see. But this means that there are people coming into reading, you know, that are not familiar with Agatha Christie or are not familiar with um, things that, you know, that seem sort of commonplace to those of us who've been reading it longer. So I think it's, I think it's marvelous. Jane Austen is selling really well. I know, so. I think it, there's probably a lot of people discovering it and then a lot of people saying like, oh, this is kind of a comfort read to me. You know, right. I'm going to just go back and read all of Agatha Christie this year because it's a crazy year out there and I'm stuck at home. So That's right. why, why not? What <laughs> what better than to go through all of the, all the Poirots? No, I think absolutely that, you know, being the pandemic did encourage people to do a lot of that kind of reading, but I also think that part of it, as I said, is that new, you know, new readers are coming along mm -hmm. and want to learn the classics. So, Patrick, have we got any questions or anything that Catherine might want to answer? Sure. Um, let's see. Michelle asks, if Lily Adler were made into a movie, who would you fan cast? Oh, I get asked this one a lot. I'm, I'm so terrible at it because I feel like, first of all, I don't think I know actors very well anymore. I think I really did like 10 years ago, but there's so many from all the, you know, like prestige TV shows that are out there now. Um, but I have a really hard time with this because this is a very weird thing about me as a writer is I don't see people's faces when I'm writing. I think everyone sort of pictures different things. Um, and I don't, I don't see the characters physical faces when I'm, when I'm writing them, I don't see that in my mind. So trying to picture, um, trying to picture actual actors or, performers in those roles is something that I just I I really can't do. Well that's interesting. What what do you see? Do you see these kind of amorphous I mean I, I see people I see bodies and I see people moving and I always know what characters are doing with their faces. Um my one of my first careers was as a performer. I worked as an actor and as a dancer. So I tend to really physicalize my writing. Like I always know what people are doing with their faces and with their bodies. But I tend to see bigger picture when I'm writing rather than seeing, you know, what someone's face is. I see them in the space and I see them interacting with other people. Um, but I, I don't actually see like what their, what their face looks like. So I couldn't, I can describe what's you know, like on the page. I always know, you know, who has what hair color, who is what height and what eye color and what's their weird physical quirk that my editor always tells me that I need to say about 50 times less in every book. Uh, but I don't, I don't actually see their faces when I'm writing. Wow, that's really interesting. It's a weird uh, thing, right? But I have I have talked uh, to a lot of writers, and I'm not the only one out there who's like that, which was very reassuring when I found that out. Right. Um, let's see here. Uh, what is your favorite part of the writing process? I think I probably have have two favorite parts. I think the initial idea when you sit down and you have that first burst of inspiration when you have a new idea and you're thinking like, oh, I'm really excited to do that. Um, I think that is always just such a lovely feeling to be embarking on a new project and, and diving into something new like that. But that will usually last me through maybe maybe 20 to 30,000 words and then the, just the horror of having to finish the draft and actually figure out what the rest of the book is tends to set in. So after that initial creative burst, my favorite thing is editing because it means that the book is already written and I just have to tweak it. I just figure out have to have to figure out how to make it better and how to bring it, bring everything together and really just get a, a satisfying feeling to it. Uh, so but the part in the middle where you're you're writing most of the first draft of the book is the hardest thing for me. Uh, let's see, what what is your average writing day like? I really wish I had an average one, um, but at this this point in my life, I do not. Uh, my schedule tends to vary almost almost daily. Um, I've got two very young children with sort of inconsistent school and daycare schedules. I've got another job in addition to writing. So the whatever i'm I'm prioritizing on any given day is really what's what deadline is coming up soonest. Um, I tend to, you know, if I've got a deadline coming up, I will get up early to work. Generally, I work better early in the mornings and rather than late at night. But if, you know, I'm on a, a tight timeline, I end up doing both anyway. Um, but, you know, I 
I really like um, just having having time to only be writing. I don't try to really be doing a lot of different things at once. Um, you know, I'm not if I'm if I'm writing, I'm working on that project. I'm not trying to go back and forth between two different books in a single day. I'm not trying to do both my writing and my my day job at the same time. So it's a, it's very much of a, a mishmash fitting things together at this point. And I'm really hoping that at some point in the future, it'll be a little more consistent. Um, but right now it's just sort of trying to get everything, everything done in a week that needs to get done and always discovering that there's, there's something that didn't get checked off the to-do list at the end. You're going to be depressed to hear the ad says, uh, it doesn't, it doesn't change. <laughs> well, that's actually very encouraging because it means that I'm not doing it wrong now. No, you're not doing it wrong at all. I mean, every day I get up and think about all the things I'm actually going to get done. Every day I get shot down or Shanghai <laughs> or whatever it is that it doesn't work out the way I planned. <laughs> but what, what can you tell us about your day gig? Um, it's also a kind of writing. I do um, editing and like quality control and uh, fact checking for a number of um, online publishers so like website content um financial stuff uh, a lot of a lot of finance um and then i also write for a few magazines and some local publications so it's a it's another kind of writing but it tends to use a very different set of writing and editing muscles than writing a book does which is nice because i like bouncing back and forth between the two of them if i'm feeling really stuck on a draft or an editing problem i can sort of let it just sit in the back of my mind while I go use sort of the other side of my writing brain to do a different kind of work. And a lot of times I'll find that I come back and have have really fresh ideas or I've fixed a problem without really knowing that I was going to fix it. So I like using, I like doing sort of both the uh, the very creative generative kind of writing and then the slightly more technical side. There's a question about, um, are, are there any historical periods that you haven't written about yet but that you've always wanted to write about I mean so so many but there's it's a little bit intimidating to contemplate because you know every every new era is its own giant research project um I think uh the Elizabethan era is just fascinating to me like I said I used to work as an actor um and I did a lot of Shakespeare back in the day so I you know, that that era and the the writing that was happening and sort of the big cultural changes in that era. I I would love to say that someday I'm going to dive into it, but there's just so much there that I know the the research would probably overwhelm me. I don't think that's ever going to be my era. Um I think I'm more likely to dive into something Victorian because it's a little it's a little less of a giant jump um uh, back in time. You know, if I just move on a little bit from the Regency or dial it back a bit from the 1920s and you kind of you kind of get there um but again it's you know everything is a, a big research project but i do it i do enjoy the research side of it so we'll see where i end up next who are some of the shakespearean roles that you played let's see um i think my one of my favorites is one that i did in actually an undergrad rather than professionally i was um tybalt in romeo and juliet which was a really fun bit of um gender cross-casting um and it was actually how i met my husband funny enough he played mercutio so i i got to stab him on stage um nice. that was that was how we met uh but uh that was that was really enjoyable just because it's such a, a fun and angry character and has some really great fight scenes um midsummer is another favorite role i did a production of uh antony and cleopatra that was just just remarkable um i think the histories get not as not as much top billing outside of you know like real hardcore theater circles um but they're you know just as dramatic and over the top and crazy as any of the any of the comedies or tragedies so they're a lot of fun to play with um let's see here okay renee asks uh, how do you celebrate the publication of one of your novels nice question I like that. Um, mm -hmm. I always try to do something to celebrate. Uh, if you talk to most writers, they will say that pub day itself when the book actually comes out is always a bit weird because it's always a Tuesday and you're just trying to get through your normal life. A lot of times, if you, if you've got specific events happening, then, you know, sometimes they'll be on that day, but a lot of times they're not till the next weekend or even later in the month. So, um, I always, I always try to do something a little bit celebratory on the day of whether that's, you know, 
going out with a friend or, you know, putting the kids to bed early and having a nice dinner at home, open up a bottle of champagne, that sort of thing. Um, but I also, I really like just, you know, do, doing events, traveling around, going to different bookstores, meeting readers. I think that's one of my favorite parts of the process. Um, I'm actually very, very extroverted. So the, the sitting at home and writing can get kind of lonely sometimes. So I like actually going out and meeting people. Let's see. Andy, um, oh, a question from uh, Robin. Uh, Barbara, did you have Sue Grafton there in the early days? Um, the first book that Sue came to see us with was, see, it was either F or G. I can't remember which, but no, she started the writing. The in, alphabet. <laughs> she started writing um, in the early 80s, and I didn't open the store until 1989, so um, we didn't catch her. I'm pretty sure it was F. Um, I could look at my bookshelf, actually, because I have that one. And then um, when we moved to the store that we're in, Patrick, do you remember in 1999, Sue rearranged her entire book tour and came to open the store. And we had 1,500 people. I've always remembered that because they wound around the box. Remember, that was the infamous strawberry martini drinker who came down the alley and threw up on Sue? <laughs> yeah, no, I do remember that. Yeah, I mean, it was, it, yes, we've had some, we've had some amazing moments and, you know, I love Sue, and we we had agreed to go to Z together. She made me promise that I wouldn't retire before Z, and it was it's still a great sadness for me that that we didn't get there. We had to stop with Y. Actually, we stopped with the book before. She was kind enough to autograph Y for me, but she was too sick by then to do anything. So I miss her. You know, that's a project that one really wished she could bring to completion because it was such an interesting project, but life intervened. Anyway, so Catherine, it's been a great pleasure to talk to you. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, let me remind everybody that Murder at Midnight is indeed a Christmas story. It's a Christmas Regency Agatha Christie, as I said at the beginning, and um, makes a great gift. If you have not read the series, you can read this book. Um, you don't have to have started at the beginning, but, um, you know, why not go back and read the first three <laughs> there in print? It's only three books. And then you can give this to yourself as a Christmas present. What a good idea. So I hope you'll come and see us on another occasion, Catherine. I would love to. Thank you so much for having me chat with you this evening. It's been a pleasure. It really has been a pleasure. Good night, everybody. Thank you so much. Enjoy the rest of your night. Good night.